So as discussed earlier, our topic is ethical decision-making, especially when it pertains to AI hiring. Next slide, please. So the background and motivation behind our project is mainly from Amazon's failed recruiting system in 2018 and our own personal experiences. In terms of Amazon's failed AI recruiting system, it had taught itself to be biased against women. And this bias did not exist in the system, but instead existed in the data. So the data that it was trained on was mostly from male resumes over a 10 year span. And the system had taught itself to look for words such as executed, which were more often found in male resumes. And in terms of our own experiences, we've all, we've been, all been in that situation where we're applying for, for our first job or internship and we lack some solid work experience. And in that situation, it is really your intangible assets that will set you apart, such as your work ethic and team chemistry. And when applying for a job, we're often asked to send a cover letter to accompany your resume, but this cover letter often gets overlooked, even though it is what where our intangible assets lie. Next slide, please. This leads us to our problem statement. How can we devise an AI system that has a creative capacity to recognize qualified applicants, not simply through their resumes, but also through their intangible assets? Next slide. So we identified two main needs during our development process. One, we needed an algorithm that ignores sensitive attributes such as race, gender, and sexual orientation. And to solve for this, we, we found the counterfactual fairness algorithm. And two, we needed a solution that ensures that cover letters are taken into account at the initial screening stage. Next slide. So just to give you a brief overview of our solution, on the left, you see a Venn diagram where we have a pool of resumes that are filtered by the ATS and a pool of cover letters that we would like to be filtered by a separate ATS. Where they both meet are the filtered cover letters and resumes that are eventually sent to the counterfactual fairness algorithm. And on the right, we kind of we just kind of visualize the pipeline here where the resumes and cover letters are filtered and then sent to the cover, counterfactual fairness algorithm. So basically in this pipeline, we have two firewalls where the resumes and cover letters pass through to ensure that the best applicants are still sent to the recruiters. But because we have cover letters screened at the initial screening stage, we're also accounting for some of their intangible assets. Next slide. So to um, perform our ethical analysis on the original problem, one of the ethical ideologies we chose to um, use is relativism. And essentially, just to recap, relativism is the idea that each group can have their own um, moral principles and no one is to judge if they are right or wrong, um, essentially to each their own. So in this situation, it translates to every business has its own needs. So uh, these AI systems currently they're trained to predict future job performance, but it doesn't seem right to be able to gauge that information by simply just one resume that sums up all your achievements and everything that would suit you for this role, which is why we introduced the idea of cover letters and filtering this together. And since employer demands are constantly changing, uh, it would mean that the inherent bias that still lies in these data sets which are used to train the AI would, um, would still prevail once uh, future applicants apply and the AI is still using previous applicants that were good for the company's previous needs to base new hires off of. And essentially this becomes unethical because machines are meant to be unbiased tools and in the situations they do have much inherent bias uh, in the data set which they are trained with. Uh, next slide, please. And the other ethical analysis ideology that we use to analyze this is utilitarianism. And just to recap on that, utilitarianism is essentially um, being able to get the greatest good for the lowest cost. So in this situation, it would be for companies to save the most time and money to get the most uh, qualified applicants. But it really becomes a difference here when we define what actually is qualified, because again, that is something that is defined by the company itself and which when it goes through an AI, it does have an inherent bias. And in this situation, 
the AI is trained to take the most efficient route to find the most qualified candidate candidate, and it won't go the extra mile to find other candidates who could be more qualified simply based off of what's on their resume and what the AI sees is just their resume. So it won't find people from uh, diverse backgrounds that could be just as, if not more qualified. Um, but essentially it only looks for people in um, in the system which have triggered keywords that the AI was trained to look out for. Um, and this, this ultimately becomes unethical because the common problem ends up being that not everyone is given uh, a fair chance to be judged by the AI. Next slide. Okay, so our expected outcome is to have an AI follow some guideline to use quantitative measures, but also take qualitative characteristics into account. Um, this is because we need both types to measure, to accurately measure how well a fit a candidate will be. If we only use one or the other, we can't accurately gauge a candidate. Each recruiter or company will need to come up with their own set of qualitative characteristics that they believe to be the most important or fit most of their goals. Um, with that being said, though, we still discuss two of the most important qualitative characteristics. Um, the first is diversity. So diversity allows people from different backgrounds to bring in new perspectives. And if we had most people from the same backgrounds, they would likely tend to come up with the same ideas. So diversity helps to foster creativity and innovation. And the second is team chemistry. So team chemistry is important because people will not just be working individually because companies are made of a large number of people who must form teams to accomplish their goals. So people need to know how to work well with other people. Team chemistry also encompasses several other desirable traits such as communication, uh, respect, conflict resolution, and leadership. And we also need to address uh, fairness and bias with some qualitative characteristics being valued and prioritized over others. There are also some people who are potentially being discriminated against in the hiring process. Uh, the example we had was the Google Memo echo chamber. Um, since Google is a left-leaning company, people who do not conform with their political stance, like people on the right or people in the center, uh, they may be discriminated against or they may not even be considered as a possible candidate. So therefore, we also have to keep in mind non-discriminatory practices. Uh, the main objective of this report uh, is obviously to develop an AI that can produce fair decisions among a wide variety of candidates. And the biggest problem is uh, what is deemed fair. Uh, and the algorithm is deemed fair when none of the pro uh, protected characteristics such as gender, age, ethnicity, et cetera, are definitively used when making a decision. And the algorithm produces similar predictions for similar individuals and candidates. Next slide. Uh, uh, the definition uh, based off algebra of fairness is, let's say, and I'll remember this, uh, this definition for a little bit, it's a, it comes back at the end, is let X and Z be both protected or non-protected and protected attributes of a candidate respectively, and Y is the expected uh, outcome model. And as you can see, the expected outcome of Y given X and Z should also just be e equal to the expected outcome of Y only given X, which means that there is no correlation Hopefully, that is like that's like the that's the goal that there's no correlation to Z, a protected uh, protected characteristic when uh, the algorithm makes a prediction. Next slide. This introduces us to uh, indiscrimination, also known as redlining, and an example of indirect indiscrimination is say we have a hypothetical AI that uh, has developed an algorithm that prefers candidates that reside in location A when, compa when compared to location B. While where a candidate doesn't reside is, uh, isn't considered a protected characteristic, 
in certain situations, there's a strong correlation between an individual's residency and their ethnicity. Uh, so at the same time, you you believe that you're not, uh, you don't have any bias in your algorithm, you're directly affecting a certain group that has protected characteristics. And we'll talk about that more in the future. Uh, next slide. This introduces us to uh, actual causality. And it's a critical component for responsibility for a decision. It helps seek explanation for all sorts of observations, in this case, hiring. Uh, like, did the candidate not get a job because he lived in location B rather than location A? Or was it due to the fact that they were race C rather than race D? And being able to figure out actual causality is the main goal uh, of our report. Uh, and it helps figure out why a final candidate was predicted by the AI. And that will help snuff out any bias and discrimination in an algorithm that might develop. Next slide. And that introduces us to our uh, main point, which is counterfactual fairness, which was defined and established by the Allen Turing Institute. And basically making a decision that are fair ensures outcomes are the same in the real world, real world versus counterfactual world, where an individual has a different demographic. And an example of this would be the red car example. And basically, imagine you have a car insurance company that wants to price insurances and predict their accident rates with an algorithm. The company assumes that aggressive driving is linked to both drivers being more likely to have accidents that, and their preference for red cars. Well, it seems like the red car a preference is a good way of predicting who will cause accidents. There could be other variables at play. Like for example, like what if a particular race, like stated in the beginning, uh, has more, is more likely to drive a red car? But there's no, they're no more likely to cause an accident than any other race. Uh, in this attempt to be fair, you're actually discriminating against that race by uh, pricing uh, people that drive red cars uh, more, uh, more. Even though there is no uh, direct factors like the red car preference, uh, you are uh, you are uh, strictly linking race to that. Uh, next slide. Uh, and the definition that I have uh, uh, that our group has derived uh, is that the value of y, if z had taken the value of z, which is basically counterfactual, uh, is stated as y z approaching another z, uh, and a prediction outcome y is considered counterfactually fair if y for all outcomes equals y z for all possible z values that z can take. And Z sh basically should not be the cause of Y for any individual instance uh, or candidate. And manipulating Z while holding all other parameters, manipulating Z, which is protected characteristics, while holding all other parameters constant, should not change the distribution of an expected outcome for Y. Next slide. And that brings us back to what Harad was talking about at the beginning with the cover letter ATS being filtered in with the resume ATS which then this algorithm can be utilized and appropriately designed and eventually sent to recruiters. Next slide. Stated above, filtering resumes with cover letters, we'll be able to find our best candidates, which then are sent to the counterfactual fairness algorithm to, to help figure out if there's any correlation uh, between a, a protected characteristic and a non-protected characteristic, which will eventually be presented to recruiters with the best candidate. Next slide. And while the concept of counterfactual fairness is still widely unknown to many, there's strong evidence that will be utilized moving forward with machine learning discrimination. And I do really recommend going and reading the paper that we cited in our paper, it, it goes into a lot of depth about uh, counterfactual fairness. And that's it. I think you're muted, Professor.
Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you for letting me know. Now I can want to repeat that part. Uh, thank you for your presentation, all of you. Um, um, as I mentioned before we started the recording, uh, I, I was asking about uh, um, the non-protected attribute versus a protected attribute. What's their relationship? I mean, for example, red car. Is, is the color, let me, let me just be, uh, just clarification is the um, the color of the car I drive, is this the uh, non-protected or protected attribute? That's a, that's a non-protected attribute okay. that just has a strong correlation with a protected right. attribute. Right, so right. I, I kind of explained that poorly, but while, uh, while the insurance company believes that they're being uh, fair and unbiased, they're directly discriminating against the race and they have no idea. But the counterfactual fairness algorithm would be able to back check that and see that there right. is bias to a certain race right. Uh, right. because of a strong correlation to the non-protected characteristic. Right. Mm -hmm. So so that, that that's good. I, I mean, the, the red car, I like the red car uh, example, by the way. It, it's also, I have a bias that uh, I don't know if that's true is uh, uh, the the police the, the the on the highway they it seems to me they always pick on red car that's 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 another thing uh, I've, that's, I've that's too, so yeah I understand yeah. that <laughs> yeah so so my my question is that um, a a system like uh, Amazon's uh, um, AI recruiting system. Um, how do we actually discover? Um, I guess the my first issue is that how do I actually discover um, that a non-protected attribute is actually correlated or causality to a have a causality to a protected attribute? How do we actually discover that from the data? Well, I think that if you like kind of notice that like, hey, this non-protected attribute, um, a lot of people are being discriminated like with this attribute, you can just take a pull of those applicants and kind of just, you can, I believe there, there should be an algorithm where you can identify which attributes they have in common. And if there's like a significant correlation between like, the non-protected attribute and like one of the protected attributes that each applicant might have, for example, such as race, then you can kind of have good cause to say that those two are correlated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I, that, that is something which is, I think there is a way to do that uh, uh, statistically or, or using some of the uh, algorithm to, to, to actually check whether um, some of the attribute in the in the X category, a group of them maybe they are actually it's not just one to one. It might be a group of them is actually associated with another group of them in the in the. Um, I mean, in in some sense, what what this turned to be? If I want really want to be really um, uh, unbiased for uh for for z for the protector z i really need to find a bunch of x a bunch of x which is totally orthogonal or independent to the any of the z i'm actually protecting so so if you think about a uh, a concept called principal component analysis have you heard about pca it's essentially saying that what are the most important attribute in a data set that's actually represent the, uh, the, the, how do I say that? That those are the component I really care. And they're pretty much uh, independent of each other. And those are become the, 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 the kind of attribute that really, really matter. So I think that uh, that need to be, um, Examine, check. There is a way to do that in the in the using statistical algorithm to do that. I think that that's okay. So that's number one. Number two, I want to ask you didn't address this very much, and I I don't think anybody could have done that uh, easily. Uh, the question about job performance, because assuming I can I can separate X and Z nicely, take care of the red car issue. 
but I still need to deal with the issue is how do I actually define what is job performance? So, so what, what do you think Amazon uh, or whatever system you know, how do they actually decide what's, what's the job performance? I think um, they would base job performance based off of the set qualifications that they desired for the role. So if they have uh, categories like, uh, I'm not categories, uh, qualities A, B, C that they're looking for in a candidate, and perhaps one candidate has A, B, C, while one candidate only has A, it makes it more likely that candidate A, B, C would be more likely to perform well on the job just in terms of hard skills that are required for it. Okay, so so they when you talk about job performance, you're talking about the attribute that's actually presented in the in the um, in the resume and maybe in the cover letter. Because when I read it, the other way to uh, to interpret that is actually look at the real job performance after they got hired. You understand what I'm saying? So they're actually looking at the 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 what they did after that. So so there there was a study around 2009. Um, it's by IBM internally by IBM Research, um, and, and and the work is is actually looking at all the performance data, about 400,000 uh, IBM employee around the world, and and. In that study, they actually look at what is their performance related to the team organization. The team organization means that they have uh, one strong uh, um, um, first line manager and basically um, um, managing directly hierarchically to the small team versus the other team formation, which the team is actually like a peer to peer everybody about the same, the, the same kind of the role and they collaborate. And, and the thing is that um, they, they then, the, the job performance is how much money that unit actually earned over the year. So they look at their email about all this, how they actually communicate to decide whether this, this team organization is, is actually um, um, a, uh, uh, how do I say that, peer-to-peer -peer or more hierarchical uh, in terms of their topology. And then they look at how much money this unit made uh, over the year uh, means that their performance. So, so that was one of the thing, one of the large scale study that was very interesting. It was done by uh, IBM Global. Look at, you know, globally, I think it's, they, they touch on 400,000 employees, email and, uh, um, um, it's very interesting, um, but but that job performance is certainly being criticized because you look at the money you make, which that is actually shadow and, and determined by a lot of other factor about about that. So, but overall, interestingly, the result indicate that when the team leader is dominating, is more hierarchy, uh, that team tend to perform better, meaning that they tend to make more money for IBM, which makes sense if you think about that because the team leader is dominant, so he actually grabbed the project, that's actually going to easily, easier make money, for example. So that, that's why it's, it's actually, it, it, it became not necessarily as a topology from the sociology perspective, but it's just the leader is actually determined the, the performance. Okay, so I, I thought that, uh, um, okay, let me, then let me ask this question. Do, do you think it's a reasonable to, to train this kind of system um, based on the uh, after hired performance? Uh, so, Oh, sorry. Did you want to go? Yeah, I think that that would be reasonable after some a good amount of data can be gathered. But then again, that can't be done until this system that we have is implemented, and these mm. workers are already out <clears throat> like working in like in the agile method and seeing if they can deliver on their deliverables every few weeks or so. But I think that could be a good like next step, I guess. 
yeah mm -hmm. well, well, I, I, well you, you're you're right uh harold uh if if a, a company keep all the resume that was submitted at the time that uh the person was hired say for the past 10 years and maybe they have some data to do some of that um, a, a company like Amazon or, or, or Facebook, Google, or IBM, if they, if they have all the data, then that, that's actually could be. Okay, so, so I think your answer is, question is, is reasonable, but then I'm, I'm actually go back to the answer that Abbas mentioned uh, earlier. Abbas says, when, I, when, when you guys talk about job performance, you're, you're talking about the um the qualification some of the some of the things that you actually see that on the on the resume and i assume that qualification was determined by the by the manager right it's by the hiring manager about what they want okay okay so kind of to to reiterate um what i was saying earlier was the current problem that there is there's just simply a, a resume that goes through the system and job performance is based off of what qualities one possesses at the time of when they apply. Mm -hmm. um, and what we want to do is we want to add. So those those um, qualifications that candidates have are solely quantitative. We want to add that qualitative aspect, which can definitely be done by um, factoring in more cover letters and finding the, the union in between the resume and the cover letter, which would kind of set a new metric for how um, job performance could be gauged um, by the AI by using now both quantitative and qualitative features. Okay, may, may I ask, uh, um, any of you will graduate uh, at the end of this quarter? Oh, okay, congratulations, I wrote. And, and I assume that you're doing job hunting process right now. You don't have to answer that. I realize this is actually private, uh, but um, either you already did or some of you will be doing is doing this kind of uh, um, interviewing process, right? I mean, you have uh, several round and eventually you're going to, um, there, there are some, some of the interview will be technical and some of this eventually you will be um, uh, either Zoom or face-to-face -face with the hiring manager. Um, so there is a lot of qualitative issue that will uh, be addressed in a non-AI way, basically is determined by human at the later stage of the interview. So, so what, what you contribute is early stage of the, of the interview to help to uh, kind of narrow it down to that. Um, so I guess, I guess my question is, it's interesting that you guys talk about the, the qualitative, uh, part and the quantitative part, uh, that both important. Um, so, so my question is that, do you think is, is actually, uh, a important thing for you to think about using machine learning approach to deal with the qualitative part at the early stage of the interview, or is alternatively, um, those part will be, will play a role at the later part of the interviewing process where the, um, the machine learning is going to be, um, um, play no role at all. Uh, what's your thought on that? Yeah, I think it's definitely important to have it in, at like an earlier stage, because like you said, when you meet with um, like the hiring manager or recruiter in person, you will not just get a technical assessment, you'll also get a behavioral one. But obviously that whole stage in the hiring process is after your resume passes through the ATS system. So having a separate ATS that will look at the cover letters will kind of ensure that some of the applicants that wouldn't otherwise get seen at the earlier stage will be looked at eventually. So I guess having, to, it does, it never hurts to have two looks at the behavioral mm -hmm. um, characteristics of a person, kind of like how, like in today, we're just looking at the resume through the ATS, but the hiring manager also will ask you about your resume in person too. Right. So, so, so let me, let me, uh, 
follow up on that. I mean, it, it's good to have a, uh, um, uh, a, a another ATS system to look at the cover letter. Um, but my worry is the following. Uh, so so let, let me be honest with you, because ultimately what we try to address is qualitative, the qualitative perspective. But when we use machine learning, everything become qualitative. Even initially it was qualitative. So uh, on the other hand, if the, the secret is out about how the cover letter is being use in the ATS system, like the way you describe, then I, if I want to make the cut to the final stage interview, I will probably re-engineer my cover letter in the way that I think that will give me the best quantitative chance to actually be able to go through. And some of the people who are not unaware, totally unaware of this. He just wrote a, a, um, a cover letter from his heart or her heart. It, it, it might actually become a disadvantage of that because they didn't know the algorithm. So what, what, what's your thought on that? It, it's a hard question, but uh, I wonder if you have any, any uh, Yeah, I mean, that's uh, definitely a valid concern. Uh, I think that's one that we kind of failed to take into account where people could, if they find out about the algorithm being used, they could just re-engineer their cover letter, <clears throat> which would put those people that we want to be seen at more of a disadvantage than they already are. Um, off the top of my head, I cannot really think of how we could prevent that. Yeah. So, so here, here is something which is uh, I, I, I don't think machine learning today is is very well uh, developed for this, but I think it's possible for the future AI algorithm to do this. Is that I, I might be able to detect how innovative the letter itself is. So, me, meaning that if you actually follow some kind of template, follow some kind of guideline about how to write a, a cover letter to survive the system, you might be able to see some of the similarity or some of the um, 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 pattern that's actually people write such kind of letter. It's going to be cat and mouse game because people are just keep changing that. But on the other hand is somebody who is, whose letter is obviously by himself, is obviously by himself and and is, is, sorry, I should say by himself or by herself. It's, it's, it's like this letter is, is very different, is very customized, is, is very, uh, how do I say that? Fairly innovative. Um, and we might be able to, AI system might be able to uh, um, 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 differentiate that. Also, it's even possible to detect whether this person has asked other people to write the letter for, for him or for her. It's just, just I mean, I would give you an example that uh, I remember we were um, uh, evaluating uh, the, the graduate applicant. I mean, the graduate applicant, they send, send, their, send their package to us. And, and we look at their uh, uh, statement of purpose, which is the same of purpose they write really, really well or really, really poorly. And that, that's actually important. I remember one of the case that we actually don't, the faculty, we actually don't believe that the student actually wrote that statement of purpose. It was too good. It was really, really good, but that particular candidate's, uh, uh, the, I think either one of the English score is so low. So basically we're saying that, I think it's either the writing uh, GRE written test or whatever. Um, it, it, it's just saying that, well, it's inconsistent because the letter looks really, really fantastic. Sorry, the statement of purpose looks fantastic, but some other uh, element 
in the in the um, in the whatever the profile doesn't fit that. That that was an interesting example. So so dealing with qual qualitative, uh, it it might be uh, you we need to. You guys, if, if you want to develop this, you might want to play some tricks over there as well, like that. Okay. Let me see my, uh, the other question. Okay, um, Henry, I think in your, in your presentation, you actually said something uh, um, caught my attention. Um, so you mentioned about, um, in, in certain industry uh, uh, in the Silicon Valley, they're, they're more left leaning. You remember what you said, Henry? Oh yeah, uh, I was using the example from the Google the memo. Google, yeah, the Google yeah. memo. So, so there is a, a left leaning, but it might be, became a disadvantage to, to the uh, to the uh, how do I say that to the um, to maybe people in the more of a, a moderate or or central uh, political leaning. Um, so can you can you actually uh, say a little bit more about what's your observation on that part? Um, yeah, so basically, uh, since Google is, or some of these companies tend to be more left leaning, they are, they probably will tend to more likely hire the same, uh, the people who share the same uh, political stance who are also left leaning. So then that potentially discriminates or even like cuts off all the people who aren't within that same political, uh, who don't have that same political stance. Right, a, a related question I want to ask is that, I, I, I forgot whether you guys uh, uh, point that out. Um, is age of a candidate protected or, or non-protected in your opinion? Age of the candidate. I would say in some situations it's protected uh, and in some situations it's not protected. Like I don't want to hire a 15 year old software engineer for like Google, but like in, I'd say in the majority of cases, I feel like age should be protected if they do have the, uh, if they do have the qualitative and quantitative factors that would make them eligible to be hired. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I have, I, I don't know if you guys, uh, uh, um, have uh, have shared similar observation uh, I have. Um, many of the company, except the higher level manager, most of them are, are actually um, in computer programming, I'm talking about. Most of them, the, the, the higher is probably under 35 or even younger. If, if you look at the majority of the, I, I, they must have some, statistics to show the, the company, the, the company we're talking about, uh, Google, Facebook, Amazon, or, or Twitter, or Discord, those kind of uh, uh, company, they, they tend to be younger in, in that hiring process. So, okay, that's, that's another thing which I'm thinking. I, I just wonder, they're, they're for good reason that why, why um, it's like that. It, it's because it could be, just it could be just correlation because the the skill set they want to look for is just fit to that okay but yeah that, that's good okay all right i don't have any more questions this is a really i feel uh, number one as i uh, as i said that earlier um, um i want to thank all of you to uh put uh a really great effort to work on this project, to have a, a, a really well-written uh, report. I, I really like your report when I, when I read it. Um, and also this is a very important uh, topic. Um, I, I, I just hope that, uh, um, that 
somebody will pick up this idea to continue. I mean, I said somebody, not necessarily any one of you, but um, somebody from an industry. They need to look at the things more more carefully, uh, which which help us to um, um, handle some of the uh, unfairness issue in the in the hiring process. Which um, it, it, when when you guys talk about, uh, I forgot who actually said that. It could be a boss. It could. Be be Harold, I forgot. Maybe may, maybe is 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 Garrett. You talk about uh, somebody's um, the democratic. Sorry, not democratic. The location they're from is actually potentially uh, a, a important factor of being. Um, I think those kind of things are very important because we want diversity. We want to protect those people um, that they are actually being disadvantaged in that sense. Yeah. Okay, any question for me or anything uh, you want to uh, comment on your, your work? Okay, then I'm going to- um, I have one last thing. Um, sure. I, I just, uh, I would recommend going and reading uh, the, the paper that we uh, cited from about counterfactual fairness. I feel like you'd get, you'd, you would enjoy that paper a lot. That's- Okay. And, Okay, so it's the 2017 paper, right? Yeah, the 2017 paper. Right, right. I actually just read the, the beginning part, but mm -hmm. I think that's important. I, I, I am personally interested in uh, doing the fairness algorithm, mm -hmm. try, to, try to think about what, what is, the, the definition of fairness is, is, has a multiple definition, but counterfactual, fairness is is actually important one yeah i would definitely read the rest of the paper thank you very much uh garrett okay all right so i'm going to stop recording